So welcome everyone. And um, uh, I hope you enjoyed the clips and were able to get a good view of it and, and so on. It's amazing how many people I know that seem to be often amazing places uh, to go see the eclipse. And I just saw an article about the uh, where the eclipses will be in the next three or four years, uh, where you could go travel to if that if you've got eclipse fever now. So, but uh, maybe stay away from Iceland since it seems to be cloudy <laughs> there all winter long. So um, today we're talking about uh, uh, fiber optics. And earlier, several weeks ago, we in our first meeting, we did a quick broadband 101 where we gave an overview of fiber capabilities. But today we're going to go with a much deeper dive, not too deep, but uh, deep enough so that you'll feel pretty comfortable talking about the capabilities of fiber, uh, how it works a little bit, and and certainly the coming trends in in fiber optic networks. We're lucky to have an expert, uh, Hillary Cherry from uh, Calix. Is a uh, Calix is a company that uh, makes uh, lots of boxes that uh, run the internet, and our uh, favorite uh, provider of many uh, electric and uh, telephone cooperatives and rural. Uh, telephone companies as they've converted from their copper lines to uh, fiber optic lines. And uh, Calix is actually a company that uh, grew out of a little town in Minnesota, Bemidji, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, but they decided after a little while that maybe uh, it'd be better to be in the Bay Area and uh, head off to California and, and uh, grow a big company that way. And uh, so we miss them, but we still like them. Uh, so welcome, Hillary. Thank you very much. And um, I'm really, I am always excited to do this. I, the first time I got asked to do it, um, I will tell you that um, the week, I believe the week prior to me doing my first presentation with you, I had, I got fiber at my house. So um, we are, Illinois is coming along. And so I am really excited about this. And um, I want to thank um Bill and Reed and the Benton Institute for having me um, speak today, as well as just sponsoring this education. I think that um, the Illinois Soybean Association and all of you being involved in this is just really powerful, and it says something for you and your communities and what you're trying to do. Um, so I, I work for Calix. I am responsible for helping uh, telephone cooperatives and ILEX, which is independently um, owned local exchange carrier carriers, develop successful um, go-to-market strategies, elevate their overall broadband um, subscriber experience, and help them grow their businesses. So Calix provides an end-to-end -end solution. Um, we actually do all the hardware on the back end for the networks, all the way up to the in-home networking equipment and um, the software that runs on top of that. So um, we have expanded dramatically over the last few years, um, adding the software side and then some managed services um, that are basically broadband enabled services that um, run on the fiber. So I'll touch on that a little bit at the end on what we're doing on that. But um, so I have a deep understanding of the complexities involved in delivering rural broadband to um, local communities. And I'm very passionate about telling their stories and um, working directly with broadband service providers. So in addition to many years of experience um, in telecommunications industry, I also have worked um, in as an electric cooperative employee. I worked for um, Corn Belt Energy for nine and a half years in communications, marketing, PR, crisis communications. Um, and so I have background from both types of utilities um, and have worked with businesses across the, the state. Um, I am from Logan County. So they were actually on the last call I did. Um, I'm from Illinois, born and raised here. Um, and I'm actually, I'm 
also very passionate about serving my community. I am active um, on um, the Hilltop Club in Mount Pulaski, which is a volunteer organization where we give back to the community. I have also served on the Economic Development and Planning Board. I serve on the Emergency Telephone Services Board, which is an, a, um, an appointed position for Logan County. And I was a volunteer firefighter and an EMT for a couple decades as well. So in my local community. So I'm I'm very involved and I'm very passionate about doing things that um, promote a better life in our communities. Um, so I, um, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of fiber. Um, obviously I don't, I don't know how many people on here know where Cornland, Illinois is. Are there a few people? <laughs> yes. Um, so when I, I, it's not my hometown, but when I first got married, that's my husband's hometown. So we moved there. Um, and I worked from home and had satellite internet. So I will say like, I started, um, you know, the satellite inter internet feed wasn't wonderful. I worked in this in a small community, um, really at a time when work from home was not very popular. It was in 2007, um, so not very many people did it, and it was really a struggle. Um, so you're seeing, though, um, people move due to broadband service, and that's actually what we ended up doing. Um, in 2015, we moved to Mount Platt, actually, yeah, 2015, we moved to Mount Pulaski, um, Illinois, which is my hometown. Um, and we moved there because of internet. So I, I think that we are seeing more people um, moving. And so we did do a rural migration study that says 67% of people choose where they live based on high-speed internet connections. Um, an interesting thing about uh, Mount Pulaski and where I live is I moved there and we had Comcast. So Comcast is a coax fiber based or not fiber based coax copper based um, solution. And they, um, while it was super fast and um, fairly reliable, it would still have some issues as far as latency and things like that when the kids would get out of school at like 3.30 in the afternoon or in the middle of the summer when they're all on the internet um, doing things. So um, with us, with me moving there, um, I did still see the challenges. And I, I think we're seeing this rural migration um, where they're moving to locations with high-speed internet, but you're looking at communities that maybe don't have that yet. They may have a cable provider. They may have other options that are in that community. Um, and now towns like Mount Pulaski have like five fiber providers coming into town all at the same time. And that just occurred last year when they all proposed coming in. So, um, this is coming in. It's boosting economic growth. We're seeing more businesses come into locations where um, they have fiber. And so um, I just I wanted to bring that up that, you know, it's important to look at this from the perspective of um, where people are moving. They want to live um, in out in rural America. They want to be able to um, live in small towns. They want to live, um, you know, in Illinois, in a city or a small community. And so um, being able to provide those services are is really important to what we're doing. Um, so internet in the early 90s, I'll go ahead and let you progress to the next slide. Um, so in the early 90s, it was, it was obviously like dial up service it was anything but instant. Um, we now joke now about, you know, the dial up and the AOL sounds when you had, um, when everyone had AOL internet service. Um, but at the time, dial up did serve the purpose. It was the beginning of where we are going um, now. And so dial up soon transitioned to DSL, which is digital subscriber lines. Um, and so that way people could be on the internet and use their landline telephone at the exact same time. Um, it was phased out for more advanced technology and um, higher bandwidth applications that could be run on it. And then um, coax cable, um, wireless networks and fiber optic cable um, also came out. So they are, they are much more reliable and um, also have better speeds and can do more. So 
Coax, coax is made up of copper core. Um, it transmits data faster than DSL, obviously. Um, and it's an option for multiple system operators. Um, a lot of cable companies that have been in business um, for a long time still have coax um, in their networks. And it uses the same infrastructure as cable TV, so like Comcast and Xfinity. Um, it's a good fit um, for a lot of companies as they are uh, moving out, and some are going from coax and Im implementing cable in other areas as they expand out. Um, but it's still often used in a fiber network to um, bring the internet from their central office. So their central office could be fed by fiber, and coax is still often used to deliver it from the central office to the home. Um, so it decreases time, and it's a little uh, less cost ex or less expensive because they already have all that cable out there. Um, so. But it is expensive to install. The speeds are slower than fiber. And um, you do have, like I said, network congestion, which um, when all the students are on at the same time, I live right next to the library, and um, we would see bandwidth issues at certain times when they were having like big activities where multiple people were on their, um, their networks. So the other thing is that um, uh, coax is an asymmetrical download and upload. So I will talk about that later, but it means that it's not the same uploads, upload speed as it is download speed. So you aren't, don't have the same. Um, and it's not future-proof. It's not as dependable as fiber is. Uh, wireless internet, uh, fixed wireless, 5G, which you're seeing a lot now with like the T-Mobile and Verizon, they're coming into the areas offering 5G wireless service. Um, I know T-Mobile is a big one that we're seeing um, heavily in Illinois right now, at least in my area. And um, then there's also satellite, which is considered a fixed wireless solution from the perspective that we're gonna talk about it today. Um, and basically all of these are from a uh, transmitter to a receiver. So uh, that type of um, path. So more uh, line of sight, it's, um, some of them have some issues. We're gonna go into the, um, a little more detail on the technology. And then, um, so then also wireless ISPs have radio antennas. Um, obviously they do like the dish to subscriber home very line of sight uh, dependent. We see these a lot on um, our elevators and um, higher towers around Illinois. Um, they need an unobstructed view. So a lot of times, um, even though the installation's quick and fat, they have fast speeds, um, they can be deployed in many environments. They have to be able to um, see the from one end to the other. So it might work great in the winter, but you could have trees obstructing it, obviously, in spring, summer, and early fall. Um, so you have to think about some of those things that cause um, some obstructions. And then um, the cost per unit of bandwidth can increase over time. So with fixed wireless, um, as, as the speeds are, as more, more people are being added to the network, the speeds decrease on what is available. So that's one thing that um, is important. They would have to deploy more like, equipment out in the field to keep the speeds uh, consistent. So 5G is the fifth generation uh, cellular networks. Um, it's basically 5G antenna that beams to your home um, and it's up to two and a half gig when deployed next to a ground station. So um, it does have fast speeds, but it must be in one square mile of the tower to reach those speeds. And um, satellite internet, um, which is likely a competitor in most areas that are very rural, um, the speeds are improving for them, but it's very expensive to deploy. Um, there is latency. It does have some weather impact. Um, and so that is something that has to be um, taken into account. And there are also some funding um, hurdles with satellite that we'll go into a little bit deeper. Um, so fiber has unmatched capacity um, and they, use uh, cables containing small glass 
fibers to transmit the data using light waves. Um, because the fibers are so small, each cable contains multiple fiber strands and they can transmit a huge amount of data. Um, for installation purposes, because the fibers are so small, the cables are small, they're more flexible than like a coax cable is. So um, it also makes it a little bit more um, and easier to install. Uh, performance, it is extremely fast. It has symmetrical speeds, so same up, same down, and more high bandwidth opportunities um, and low latency. Fiber also has longevity, which means that the materials are more robust, resistant to interference and signal loss. Not saying it's 100% because if it's cut, then you will lose your signal. Uh, but it is, you know, less chance that you're going to have signal loss, especially since most of it, um, it's often buried um, underground. So that is also another reason. Um, sometimes it's also hung on uh, poles, but it's often buried underground. And it's estimated to last for up to 100 years, which is an awfully long time for something that um, as far as replacement costs. Um, it has low power consumption. So... Um, one thing, and maintenance costs obviously 100 years, but it provides more like flexible options, um, but it does have a higher upfront cost to build and deploy than, for example, fixed wireless, things like that. So um, we're going to kind of dig deeper into this, but some technologies obviously struggle to offer gigabits, multi-gigabit speeds, um, but Many companies are already doing this through fiber, so um, it is it is progressing. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so what are the factors driving today's fiber deployment? Um, so we at, we at Calyx often talk about the subscriber-focused network. It's not about um, so much about the technology. It's the importance of what the subscribers are doing with the technology. So. I mentioned dial-up and DSL changed so much our technology has. Um, now people are saying cut the cord and they're streaming their television services. Um, you're talking uh, Netflix, Hulu, YouTube TV, um, Apple TV, um, also gaming, um, which requires very high bandwidth in order to do it efficiently and uh, go back and forth over the internet. Um, so that is something that is up and coming and um, gaming, uh, they're doing esports in a lot of schools now. And what's interesting about that is it's offering another team atmosphere for our students where um, they are able to work as a team, play online games, such as you would do another sport, whether it be like basketball or um you know, fishing, anything that you would have at your school that would be like a team sport, they do it in gaming. And companies are recruiting these students to go to college and go into IT fields. So it's offering another avenue for our youth to be able to be successful. Um, and then obviously working from home. I mentioned that, um, oh, I like that. And thank you, Lisa, an area school by her has uh, Mario, they do esports and Mario Kart. So I mean, that's, it's definitely up and coming. I know um, Ohio actually has a high school gaming esports network. Um, so I, I haven't heard of one in Illinois yet, but it would be really interesting if we could offer those opportunities for our students. Um, so working from home, I work from home. I obviously live in Mount Pulaski. Um, I travel a lot too. So internet, the high speed internet and fiber is extremely important. Um, I don't always have it in the areas that I'm traveling to, but um, I spend pretty much, um, I would say a hundred percent of my work day on my network. And while I'm doing that, I also have other people in my house that are often on the internet at the same time, whether they're watching TV or they're, you know, on social media and um, all of our cameras are connected at our house. So having a high speed connection that allows me to continue to work and I don't have issues while other people are also on the internet is extremely important. Um, and I mentioned my, like our cameras at our house, multitude of devices. Um, 
I think in 2019 for the 2020 census, they recorded that the average household had 25 devices. I think now it's up in the hundreds. Um, I just think of all the things like all the, you know, smart outlets, smart lights, um, your um, video cameras, television sets, the smart TVs, um, some of the refrigerators and washers and dryers and things like that are also connected. Um, so there's just a ton of use cases for how we're using our home network, uh, whether it be controlling thermostats or um, any of that. So the technology not only needs to encompass and allow for all of these different use cases, and I'm sure there's a bunch that I haven't thought of. Um, I know if there's some aging in place um, over the top broadband services that are being offered, there's um, telehealth, there's, um, you know, just a ton of things that this enables. So it needs to accommodate the, you know, what sub subscribers are doing today. But if we're installing a network in our communities, it needs to be future proof. It needs to be something that will grow with the changing needs of our entire um, community and subscribers. So um, let's see, I think we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, I did I'll make one more point that I was going to say about um, how the other than residential uses. So other than residential uses, our communities are also using um, fiber networks to do community-wide Wi-Fi um, and um, business solutions. So I want to address that just a little bit. The community-wide Wi-Fi is enabling things such as um, I said that I, I'm a was a volunteer firefighter. Um, in our community, our radios um, didn't always work. They didn't work as effectively in certain areas. We would have dead zones. And we are now seeing communities across the United States deploy what we call community-wide network um, Wi-Fi so that they have devices connected all over the entire community, um, enabling things such as like schools to be connected, um, enabling like swimming pools, parks, Ball, baseball stadiums, um, football fields, things like that to be connected to the Wi-Fi. And it enables like a seamless subscriber experience where a person can be on their phone at their house and connected to their Wi-Fi. And then when they leave the home, they're still connected to the Wi-Fi when they go to the park and it automatically authenticates them. Well, what's important for this in a first responder setting is we are also seeing people are using this to um, as a backup system to some of our radio systems, where um, one of our um, one of the, our Calix customers actually had first responders that um, were able to connect to someone's home Wi-Fi networks through the community-wide um, Wi-Fi, and they were able to continue their communication um, with hospitals and other first responders due to that when their radios failed. So we are enabling just another seamless way that our um, community can connect. I mean, they were in a rural area, a place that had normally been a dead zone. Cell phone coverage was not good there, but they were able to do it through Wi-Fi. So that is um, something that we're seeing more and more. Um, also, we're seeing people deploy it for schools in a lot of use cases where they're giving it um, access to students um, with a specific login so that they can use it throughout their entire community even if a parent is low income and cannot afford the internet service. Um, businesses are also another avenue that are really, really important in this. Um, it really drives economic um, development and growth opportunities for these businesses, um, whether it is a business that's highly um, internet driven or if it's someplace like a coffee shop or a laundromat or something like that where they may have guests coming in and needing to use the service as well. So. Um, there's a lot of different options out there. So let's dig into why fiber is important um, from an operator perspective. So um, there's pros and cons to fiber. Um, obviously, I talked about business, residential, and community. Um, and so it's important because there is huge bandwidth capacity, um, low latency, obviously. So the way the fiber works, I know Bill said you already went through fiber 101, but I mean, it it transmits at light speed because 
of the technology um, at the speed of light. So um, it's basically, I would say, it is like a Lamborghini versus a Model T. If you're thinking of the technology itself, that's how I would compare it to our former technologies. Um, and um, we need the speed in both directions. I said when I worked at Cornland, I had HughesNet. It was a satellite internet. Um, I got barely decent download speeds that came down to me. But when I needed to up, upload anything, any large files, photos, graphics files, uh, it could be a large PowerPoint presentation or something I was sending back to my coworkers, it would be tremendously slow because it wasn't the same download as the upload. Um, so it's important to know that the symmetrical speeds are um, something that's very valuable. Um, so the the other thing that um, it is, I said it's business, residential, so multiple customer segments. Um, also, we are seeing um, smart, gear, smart grid modernization. So a lot of our communities have been, um, they have had cellular or um, radio antenna access on their, um, on, I want to say their grids, on their substations, um, to sometimes on meters as well. If you have um, smart meters or a collar that would um, shut off the power due to non-payment or things like that. Um, so these were traditionally either cellular or radio um, signals. So what we are seeing now is the need for fiber connectivity to relay the information very quickly from these devices, whether it be um, the devices at the substation or the devices at the home. Um, we're seeing it right now more at the substation level where it's, they are talking smart grid. They're talking about like the grid being smart to proactively tell you if something is going to fail, what the traffic looks like, what are the, you know, what are problems out there that you would see with um, with power issues? And it's right now redu a reduction in 43% in power outages. However, um, because they're able to proactively go forward. Um, however, we are seeing it deployed more and more. So I foresee this technology getting um, even better for the companies that are using fiber for smart grids. Um, so the other thing is... Um, Monetizing 5G. So fiber is actually used to go to the 5G towers. So while the 5G is the technology that's often delivering directly to the end user, um, that is one thing that um, they are specifically using it for. Um, and then fiber has lower operational expenses. Um, it allows you to focus more on what is the subscriber experience. There's less uh, less maintenance, less upgrades. So from an operator perspective, um, the redundancy that it provides and ensuring that your network is always on is extremely important. We can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk now about, um, you know, the physical internet and um, it, the physical internet is basically just miles and miles of cables stretching across continents and the ocean floor, um, which is really interesting to me. But how does it fit into this picture? Well, if you if we start with tier what we call tier one providers, um, they are tier one network operators. So I would say like AT and T, um, Lumen, Verizon, Sprint. Um, there's only a dozen of them in in the entire world that provide tier one service. And so they, they are where we start with the fiber network for, and then smaller providers get access from these tier one networks. Um, and they get their connectivity by leasing from them and they run internet exchange ports um, from the tier one to the smaller providers. And a smaller, and I apologize, I see my internet's freezing, so hopefully you can still hear me. <laughs> um, so we I can. wonder if I should shut my camera off so I don't have this problem so much. Okay, hold on. Yeah, there we go. I shut. Let me stop my video. Okay. All right. So um, so how, how does this work? So from the 
tier one provider, then they receive the internet from what we're calling a middle mile and middle mile provider, and then it redistributes it to the last mile. Um, and then the signal on its own goes to the subscriber network. So the data center or central office is where um, you have servers, racks, optical line terminals, which we refer to as ONTs. Um, and they, from the data center, the cables run to a cabinet that's either installed in the ground or a pond node um, that is um, hung from a utility pole. And then there's splitters inside the cabinet or the node that enable cables to be split off into multiple subscriber homes. So at a subscriber home, the cable ends at the ONT. Um, and, and I just said something incorrect, so I, I apologize. I said optical line terminals and I said ONT. It should have been OLT because the end user is an ONT. Um, so at the subscriber's home, the cable ends in an optical network terminal, and it acts as a translator by turning the signal into a usable internet connection. So then the subscriber accesses the internet by connecting to an ethernet or a Wi-Fi port. So um, the OLT is on the service provider network, and um, the ONT connects um, the optical splitter to the um, home. And so the OLT essentially um, controls the packets of data and they can connect directly through what we call an edge router um, or they can connect through aggregation nodes in the transport network. So um, if you click uh, one more time, just a click, it should update the slide. So this shows how it's multiple point to point um, with a fiber network. So one fiber from the central office, which is the um, far left, um, connects to many homes and businesses with um, basically with an asymmetric operation. And what I'm saying with asymmetric is it's the same um, when it goes from the OLT to the optical splitter, but then it separates it um, into smaller, um, essentially fiber signals when it goes from um, the optical splitter to the ONT. So uh, we can go to the next slide. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about centralized optical splitters and what the outside plate architectures are. Um, so centralized optical splitters are placed in the outside plant to reduce the overall amount of fiber required. So um, they future-proof and make it easy to change out technology. So what's important about this is you've installed the actual physical fiber in the ground. And I just realized my video is still on. Okay, you've installed the actual video um, fiber into the ground. And um, so to update your technology, um, it's easy to change out what we call line cards. And um, so we can go from one gig to two gig and upgrade someone's service very easily because the hardware box essentially stays the same and you're only updating that technology every time. You're not having to update, you're not changing from a DSL to a fiber and having to relay lay fiber. It is only the, um, outside plant architecture that you are having to update. Um, so what's important about this is that um, the fiber splitters, so if you look at, so centralized split actually um, does make it easier to change technology, um, but monitoring and maintenance of this because it's a one to 32 might require um, additional infrastructure. When you have a distribute distributed split. So centralized splits very um, important in bigger cities um, where your population is more dense. Um, bigger cities, bigger towns. Distributed split is um, more of a, um, it's a one to 32 as well, but it's more of a suburban um, type of infrastructure is how I would describe it. The first level of splitting is installed in a closure not far from their central office. And then the second one um, resides in a terminal box close to the subscriber premises. 
Um, so these could be, um, they could be technically in a box that's um, outside in the ground. Um, I would say, you know, they're often green or it could be mounted to a pole structure. Um, and it reduces the splitter cabinet requirements by um, having additional terminal boxes. Um, it offers fewer monitoring and maintenance capabilities because it does have more, um, there's more things split off and so therefore more uh, equipment, but um, it does um, serve a more spread out suburban environment better. Um, Active Ethernet is point to point fiber architecture. So it is a direct connection between each um, optical line terminal and each um, optical network terminal at the end of the fiber strand. Um, and it allows shared um, network, um, sorry, shared architecture of gigabit speeds without concerns um, of the shared architecture. So um, it allows basically um, the speeds at a one-to-one -one, um, point to point architecture. And then I also mentioned distributed tap, which is optical couplers, which basically divert a portion of the light um, to opti and then optical splitters. And they equally split the diverted light into um, what we call like drop outputs. And so those are the um, outside plane architectures, but when building a network, you take these assumptions, um, you make assumptions and take them into account when you look at your expected peak utilization and what your growth expectations are. So you wanna build out this infrastructure and choose the right plant um, architecture based on what your growth expectations are in the future. And to make sure you're maintaining that consistent quality of service and the characteristics that um, your customers are going to expect. Um, and so the other things, other factors that go into planning your outside plan architectures are your geographic landscape, environmental conditions, um, availability of existing infrastructure could be a hurdle, um, types of premises, you premise equipment you will need, um, what your estimated take rate is gonna be in that community, as well as your local codes and regulations. Um, there could be codes uh, that prevent you from mounting things in certain ways or um, different regulations depending on the community itself. Um, but all in all, um, the fiber outside plant ar architecture is very um, easy to upgrade and efficient. So let's talk a little bit about rural areas. So go to the next slide. And I really wanna spend some time on um, why is why are rural areas different than dense urban areas? Well, um, in some situations, rural providers may have to use a combination of technology to best serve their subscribers. Um, we are seeing this in um, a lot of areas where I'm where they have very hard to reach or extremely expensive. Um, I would say like it, the costs are extremely expensive to get from um, one location to another. So <clears throat> we talk a lot um, is, um, I would say on the, like on the telephone electric side, we talk a lot about miles per line, um, like subscribers per mile. And so some of our rural telephone cooperatives only serve 1.2 subscribers per mile. And they still have served a lot of them with fiber. However, if that location is up a mountain or which we don't have in Illinois, so <laughs> luckily we don't have to worry about that, but in a location that is extremely hard to get to um, or uh, it just is not cost efficient to run out to that one location, it could be um, a situation where it makes sense to run fiber to a, a location such as a tower or um, we, you know, say Green Legs uh, water towers and then deliver fixed wireless access from that location. Um, so what that does is it does have a, um, it increases your subscriber reach by three times, 
but um, they do have to be in fairly close proximity in order to um, reach them with fixed wireless. And you are also talking line of sight delivery. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, eliminating land acquisition and permitting delays. Um, so fiber actually allows you to deploy it anywhere. Um, it definitely has more of a speed to market because you often see devices that could be pole mounted or strand, what they call strand mounted. Um, and they also, um, they use the fiber to go directly um, to wireless backhaul. So what I said earlier about like our 5G services, um, things like that, often the fiber network is connected to that um, to that wireless tower. And then it's connected to subnetworks towards the edge before it, the end users allow access for um, connection to the subnetwork. So it basically is allowing for increased network coverage by using wireless backhaul um, and cellular. So um, that is another avenue for this. I will say that the um, we are seeing with fixed wireless, one of the hurdles is that it is not approved for a lot of the funding. How, and I say not approved, it will be considered in some areas is what we are being told as an option, um, but they are giving preference to fiber over fixed wireless just because of the, um, the speeds, the um, technology itself isn't where fiber is, and it's going to cost more um, to upgrade in the end. Also, you have to take into consideration if you install a wireless network, um, a fixed wireless network, and um, we were just talking about the ability of um, upgrading and these multi-gig speeds, um, 100, you know, if we go to 100 gig networks, you know, <laughs> fixed wireless won't be able to handle that capacity. Um, they're barely making the, you know, equivalents of what fiber networks are now. So um, that's something to consider as you are thinking about your overall infrastructure and putting in fiber is what is your future look like for your community? What is really important to, um, you know, is it, you could install fiber or connect to satellite and serve every provider, every um, subscriber in your area, but is that the um, most effective way to go? And is that the best option? Um, so there are other use cases that we are seeing um, uh, fiber and um, wireless work together that I think we're gonna see more of. And so when we're, in, we are in Illinois, so I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about smart ag. So if you go to the um, the next slide, so, Smart Ag is something that we are we have been hearing more and more about in the last um, few years. Um, my husband is a, he's actually a retired coal miner. Now he farms with his cousin, so um, and has farmed his whole life. So very familiar with this. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the Precision Ag products that you load um, GPS coordinates into your tractor, and then it automatically does a lot of the coordination for you. Um, that is different than what we are seeing right now with Smart Ag. Um, we are seeing weather stations, um, irrigation systems, uh, moisture, soil moisture uh, stations, and all these different connected devices being used out in the agricultural industry. We're also seeing um, monitoring of, um, I want to say it like, uh, animals such as a hog operation monitoring the um, basically the temperatures and um, sometimes the methane levels in different um, environments for those animals and um, a lot of them are using um, fiber to the specific farm location and then a um, Wi-Fi wireless connection a Wi-Fi connection to meets their needs to go from building to building or to um, go out to these weather stations and things like that. Um, so it makes it more fast and reliable and um, we are going to continually see this in, as it evolves in the future. Um, 
we can go to the next uh, slide. So how does this really impact our agriculture? Um, we are currently seeing um, these devices are providing a 40% increase in uh, crop yield and an 85% reduction in water consumption um, in agriculture uses, and then also reduction in energy use. Um, the reduction in energy use is something that's not just specific to agriculture. Um, we're the fiber technology and the um, the plant infrastructure that has been implemented now is so much more energy efficient than it was previously that um, our providers are seeing a reduction in energy costs overall by utilizing fiber um, based equipment. So that is very important as well. Um, and then I briefly mentioned precision ag, which is the next slide. Um, so we are very likely to see this um, have more of an impact as it uh, ties into precision agriculture. We already saw John Deere launch satellite driven um, tractor. And so um, as they announced that partnership, um, I think this will continue to impact rural areas and how we are working with our, um, our farmers and all different types of um, agriculture um, areas to uh, bring other applications to life. Um, I'm sure that there's many more that would benefit our communities, whether it be, um, you know, monitoring different types of um, utility services, uh, devices that we use from a, a city and county uh, perspective. Uh, so there's just a lot out there that would um, help us and benefit our communities. So that is the end of my presentation. I am almost at an hour. So <laughs> I will open it up to questions and hopefully I can. Uh... Hillary, can you add, um, I'm wondering about your data around the ag production. Is there a study or white paper that documents some of that? Uh... I, um, I will look into that. I believe that there is. Um, we actually have been dedicating more time to that. So let me take that as a to-do and okay. I will um, I will send that to you and you can share it with the group. Some of that production increase, you know, I mean, yes. a, a, a multi-million dollar farm, if they could double their income, essentially, I don't think yes. financing rural broadband networks would require feed funding. Right. If, yes. if every farmer was going to double their income, they'd come up with a twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars or whatever to get fiber to their farm. Absolutely. And there are numbers to back that slide that I had on agriculture. So okay. I will I will pull that and send that to you. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Um I also let's see, well, we have resistance due to cost from providers to go fiber in rural areas. So we are seeing we are seeing this. However, um, I, I did mention that I have there's five for providers coming into the small town of Mount Plasky, which if you're not familiar with it, it has 1,700 people, um, not a big community. We don't have a stoplight. We're, we are fairly small. Um, they are building between every community that they serve. So... Um, and they have, some of these providers have received funding already. Um, but the one thing that I will mention is that we are also seeing a lot of existing providers. So not, I, I'm not talking new providers that are just getting into the market. I'm talking existing like telephone cooperatives, um, independently owned, family owned um, telephone cooperatives, or even electric cooperatives that provide the broadband service in the area that are partnering with, um, with different communities to bring service to their area. So it is a huge thing now, as they look at expansion and growth opportunities, they are looking for communities who are willing to help them go into these areas as well. Um, so there are a lot of partnership opportunities out there. Um, there is one in, uh, Minnesota, that they are a telephone cooperative, but now they are serving uh, three municipalities and I think two electric cooperatives and several tribal communities. And it has just been due to people reaching out to them and wanting um, 
them to go out into rural areas and serve these communities. Because as you know, I mean, if you look at, I think I'll use Corn Belt Energy as an example. They serve 18 counties in Illinois. Um, they have their miles, their members per mile of line is somewhere around, um, I think, 7.3. And so that that number seems a, like it might be it seem a little high for a rural area. But when you take their entire membership and you look at 40 percent of their members are in the Bloomington Normal area in McLean County, that makes a huge difference. So the rural areas outside are have a much, much more sparse rural area. And we are seeing providers come in and want to partner with them and other entities to serve these rural areas and get fiber um, built out to them. It is cost prohibitive in some ways, but these providers also have um, a lot of funding um, opportunities available to them and ways that they can go about this. Also, another benefit is if you are a, um, a city or a county government, um, there are different funding opportunities available to you than there may be to the to someone who's considered a telephone uh, cooperative broadband service provider. So you may have other grant opportunities where you can apply for the funding and use someone who's already existing to bring that to your community. Um, I will also say I, one thing that um, we are seeing is more strategic business alliances across the country in order to fulfill these roles. Um, and I would be happy to talk about multiple examples at another time. I won't spend my whole time on this, but um, we are seeing just a variation, whether if the city wants to run um, the network themselves or if they want their name on it. Um, if they don't want anything to do with it, but they want their community to have broadband service, um, we're seeing all kinds of variations. And um, Calix itself, we have a lot of our broadband service providers that are customers that want to form these strategic business alliances and come into communities and really help bring broadband to rural America. Um, yeah, yeah. What, and Hillary, we yeah. have an upcoming session on that in a few weeks where we're going to uh, go through all that good stuff. So that is wonderful. Yeah, great. Other questions? And Hillary Rains made an awesome point, and we are seeing that. We actually heard from NTIA that that is the plan, is that um, – they are looking at fixed wireless first and giving preference, but then, uh, or not fixed wireless first, fiber first, giving preference to that, but then they will go to fixed wireless as the next preference. So it could be even combination networks out there. Good, thanks for that, uh, Hillary Rains. And uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a compelling case for fiber, obviously with the, uh, We've encouraged people to uh, uh, look at Doug Dawson's uh, columns on a regular basis, his blog, Pots and Pans. And today he talked about the, you know, these networks that at one time fiber could provide about a gigabit or a little less, you know, to uh, per strand. And now that will be up to 100 gigabits uh, per strand here uh, coming up to serve a cluster of communities, the 32 homes in that mm -hmm. split. So if you think, you know, about wireless improving, which it certainly is, mm -hmm. uh, we'll hear more about wireless next week, uh, but the this huge availability of bandwidth through fiber optics is really going to be a game changer, I think, for, yeah. for communities. And again, you always think, well, you know, five years ago, yeah. people were pushing for fiber and gigabit service. When Google came out with Google Fiber, people said, well, what would you ever do with a gig? And now that is a standard offering for good parts of uh, America now. So in the cities through either fiber or through fiber coax networks. And it what is you come up with for that, you know, so. So it's uh, uh, always a good thought that, that fiber is this uh, kind of future-proof technology that will be a long-term asset. So, Hillary, thanks. Yeah. Do you have anything to close? Um, I just, I, I am a resource for people to reach out to if anyone has any further questions, wants to dive deeper into uh, 
basically any any topic around broadband service providers or um, if I'm not the right speaker, I will help find the right person. Or if you want to just talk offline sometime, I am available. Um, but I'm really excited to see all these communities just engage with this. There are so many economic development opportunities available. Um, and it's very exciting time to be in. Um, I, it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. And I've been in the telecommunications industry for a really long time. So um, I still remember when we had dial-up internet and as a provider. And so I, I feel like this is just, just so amazing what we're doing. Um, and so thank you all for just learning more and being devoted to your communities to, um, you know, engage with this technology and bring it to Illinois. Hillary, is there, and this is just coming to my mind right now, you know, mm -hmm. we have communities go out and interview broadband providers to check their yes. interest in either improving their existing service or coming into the community. Does Calix ever serve as a matchmaker between yes. providers and communities? So if somebody's sitting there and saying, we can't find anyone to talk to or the ones we talk to don't seem interested. Can they contact you and- Absolutely. So we actually just kicked off this last week, a more formal program around that. We have um, several of our partners that are we've partnered with because they are doing just this. Um, so we have some that are specifically wanting to come out and do, you know, multiple areas across the country. And then we have some others that if, if those aren't a fit, it could be somebody local, um, that we help match you with, but it may, it may be somebody else who you haven't considered that would be an option. Um, and so I would love to talk to people about that because that's something I've been working on with our partner team and, um, just really Obviously, our goal is to just drive that um, having high-speed broadband in all over the nation. And I obviously am very passionate about Illinois because it's where I live. So I hope that <laughs> you will reach out to me. Um, Bill has my contact information. And um, please, if you have questions, want to be matched with somebody, want to just learn more about other companies, we would love to do that. Good, great. Thank you so much. That's, I guess we should have started with that. <laughs> that's a huge resource. That uh, that sounds really interesting and, and, and helpful as our communities now are reaching out and some have very natural partners and others have uh, more reluctant partners or can't find the right people, the right doors into the company. So yes, we'll, um, uh, good, good. Well, thank you again so much. Thanks for getting up so early in Oregon. Absolutely. To be with us this morning. <laughs> I know. It's finally daylight, so. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you again. All right. Well, you everyone have a great day, and thank you for having me um, as a part of this. I really enjoyed it, so. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So much, Bye. Henry. Good. Before we get into our breakout rooms, I just want to uh, uh, spend a minute um, uh, talking about the tour and maybe get some reports we'll go through in kind of the order order in which we're uh, I'm going to be visiting next week. Uh, Boone County, can you tell me a little bit about, I have 1 p.m. on the 22nd uh, on my calendar. Can you share what you, what our plan is for that day and what we hope to accomplish? Yeah, this is uh, Justin Crone with Boone County. Um, we uh, we've been advertising it with all of our partner um, and stakeholders, and so we're we're hoping to have a, a decent turnout. Um, you know, there's I think there's a lot of questions uh, uh, on the the program, and and um, you know, there's quite a few of our um, stakeholders and partners that are not able to attend these meetings. So I, I think this is going to be a, a good way to fill the gap. I think the probably the biggest question is um, we have a uh, kind of a complementary um, process that is underway with our MPO, our Metropolitan Planning Agency. Um, and so we're, I, I think, you know, they plan on joining our, our group that day uh, at one on Monday. And so I think that uh, we're hoping to get everybody together to see, to make sure that there's no overlap and make sure that we're all pushing towards the same outcome. 
And um, so I, I would say that that's our probably our number one. And then, um, you know, there might be some other detailed questions uh, as far as the program goes. Okay. And Justin, what do you see my role there? Just to answer questions? Uh, am I a main presenter? What would you like me to do? I, I would like you to present, I guess, and, and um, you know, to kind of kick kick off the meeting with um, a background of uh, this program and um, how it, uh, um, you know, how it's uh, organized and, and the various roles. And, you know, I don't know what other agencies or what other uh, people will be there, but perhaps, um, you know, maybe that's uh, the way that we can start the meeting is just to describe the uh, describe the program and then also um, the individual uh, the individuals that are at that meeting, what their roles are to fulfill that program, and then and then probably go into question and answers. I, I we're hopeful that there will be some board members there as well. Um, they've been contacted. Uh, our county board has been contacted to uh, to attend. So um, you know we're again. I think it's uh, hopefully it's going to be an open dialogue uh, format. Maybe like the first half hour intros and and um, intros on people and programs, and then. You know, maybe the remaining session will be just an open dialogue. That sounds great. Sounds good. Thank you. You're How welcome. about Lee County? I have you in the morning on the 23rd. Do you have a time and location and uh, event plan? Lee, if you're talking, you're muted. Hey there. So Jeremy's Hi, been able to do most of the planning uh, on this. And yes, he has tours planned, site visits on different things, and a group to be gathered to be there when you plan to come. Okay. And what time do you want me there on the 23rd? I will have Jeremy reach out with a finalized time uh, so that I don't give you the wrong thing right now. So I will okay. make sure that he formalizes that with you. Okay. That sounds good. Good. And that will meet in Dixon, is that correct? Correct. Okay, good. I'll make sure he also sends you the location for where we're going to start at. Good. That sounds really fun. Thank you. Uh, on the 24th uh, in the morning, Vermilion. With one L. Yeah. Yeah, Bill, I think we're, we're going to plan a, a meeting uh, probably at the either the Vermilion County Farm Bureau or Danville Area Community College. We will get that finalized today and uh, yeah, have you present to our our stakeholder group and uh, some potential other invitees that we have. And uh, yeah, just uh, and ask you to do a little Q&A afterwards, I think. OK, good. And um, um... Uh, what time do you have a time set or you just is that going to hold that till uh, formalize that later? Yeah, we will get back to you with that um, okay. shortly. Very good. And, uh, you know, anytime uh, early, you know, early, uh, I just have to be in Lawrence uh, uh, later that day. So, uh, but good. Uh, so Lawrence County, what's the plan? Uh, Bill, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we're gonna, I, we're planning to have you do a program overview. We're going to have our group here. Uh, we're also going to have the radio, local radio station newspaper reporters, and we'd like to use your visit as a chance to promote our survey. And, and you know that's the most important thing that I think we got going on right now. We need to get our survey filled out and sent back in, and, and we plan to have you possibly talk to the radio station. He will be here uh, and, and do something to do special. So that, right now, that's what it is, and I, I'm not exactly sure about the time. It's probably 1 or 1.30 on, on the afternoon of the 24th. Okay, that sounds good. Good. I see that it's a um, pretty good drive to, from million to metropolis so we're gonna we'll want to make sure we um maybe that 1 30 would be a better time and earlier in the morning would be better for vermilion so good and then uh on the 25th i see uh massac and johnson a joint event is that still the plan 
Yes, it is. Good. And do we have a time? 9 a.m. And then we're just going to have a meeting location at the First Baptist Church. And that sounds like good. Do a presentation, please. Okay. And I think um, uh, uh, having me present is great and, and uh, love to have, I'll probably do open it up, trying to really facilitate facilitate some good conversation as well. So uh, amongst people, they can kind of tell their broadband stories or what they're working on or what they see as the possibilities and so on. These are also an opportunity for you to, uh, uh, for everyone to invite these providers you've been talking to. You know, if you feel you're going to have a good crowd of folks there, especially uh, uh, to invite providers to come in not necessarily to put them on the spot, but as listening uh, uh, to the community needs and 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 so they can hear that hunger a little bit. It's real easy for them to want to respond and, and certainly having some discussion there, some would just soon listen, not present, but that would be, you know, let them know that they're not there to present, but just to listen and hear and, and meet people. That would be a an, an opportunity depending on, on where you are with those providers. Sometimes once they want, they start talking, they want to keep talking, but we'll, I'll be able to manage that uh, on your behalf. So good. Um, well, I know that Nancy says the surveys are all ready to launch. Nancy, do you want to do a little quick thing on the surveys? Sure. Um Get my mic there. So yeah, really um, pleased that the counties were uh, just really kind of quick on the draw. And we have a few, uh, half of them that have collected responses. So it looks like that's going well. Um, I am going to jump into MassAC's room first. Um, I know we have just like a little bit of tweaking of the language. So that's kind of where we're all at right now is um counties are maybe contact me with like one small change, uh, but soft launches all around. Um, and really just congratulations on launching those surveys. And I uh, continue to be available to you. And looks like we've got a good solid five weeks um, that you're going to be pushing. And so I guess one other thing to um, keep in mind is that there will be two of our session weeks, breakout um, rooms, where I will try to already have developed these coverage maps that you'll be able to review so that you can see where you've surveyed and where you haven't surveyed. And um, those are sort of on a time uh, expiration. You get to look at them. You don't get to kind of pass them around for very long. And that's just because I think um, being able to see folks, um, you know, click on a point on a map and see that someone's filled out a survey and what address that is, is more for you to just understand what you need to target for for the next week or two of distribution and not necessarily to kind of poke around or whatever. But we look at those maps for a limited time and you develop a list to continue calibrating your distribution efforts going forward. And so um, I see maybe one or two counties that we might be able to do that next week. Um, but uh, in the weeks to come, I'll do that twice for your counties. So you'll see, you know, something in the next two weeks or so. And then maybe with two weeks left, you'll see another uh, coverage um, scenario. So you'll be able to kind of see what you need to do. And we also look at the breakdown of how well are you doing in terms of getting all the residential input, which is usually not, not, never an issue, um, businesses, farms, and public buildings slash community buildings, your your big county as assets, and then like what we call anchor institutions. You're going to want to um, push on those more than you think. Those are where I see most counties falling short is that they don't really survey strongly, um, and then they have to rush at the last you know minute, the, la the last week or so to get, um, you know, the fire departments, the hospital, the library, you know, get those public building, you know, a representative from those areas to uh, fill out the survey so that you can kind of weigh on how you want to use those assets and um, amplify those. Um, well, who was it? Hillary uh, today was 
mentioning how that is very interesting to have community Wi-Fi. So I think that relates and um, I'll be encouraging you to, to make sure that, that there's a healthy spread of responses um, geographically and then in terms of the types of um, locations. Good, thank you, Nancy. And I just want to say that five weeks sounds like a long time, but it's not. And so really just keep the pedal to the metal on the promotion and the advertising and, and uh, reminders and so on. We know that in the first couple of weeks, that's when the vast majority of people will do the survey. Um, if you can get that wave as big as possible, that's great. Uh, know that there are no extensions really to the survey deadline. It just ends up causing everyone a headache, uh, especially Nancy on our end, but also Shabika on who helps map the survey data uh, that they just don't have enough time to push through six communities uh, in a short period of time. So that deadline we had talked about, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, uh, usually about, a well, as Nancy said, five weeks from now. So uh, certainly by a, a Memorial Day, uh, you know, we're going to close that survey and, and uh, that will be it, you know, so... The other piece I would say to that is we're not just all mean about it, but we can, uh, you can leave your survey open. And if you do do a later push uh, to get people to respond, Nancy and Shabika will do a second survey response thing, uh, report for you, uh, but will not, you know, so. Right but, after the program, yeah, we, after the we program, could. So. Yes, and so when I give you your final reports, some of you might not see that recommendation, but some of you might see it where I say, let's keep surveying for, you know, uh, some months to come uh, because it would be interesting to get uh, certain types of responses and, and add those in. Um, and then, of course, extensions happy to to refresh your results so that you can use those um, going forward. But for program purposes, we stick to that deadline. So, yeah, that's that all sounds good. And yeah. um, thank you again. And good yeah, job, everybody. You. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions or comments or had any great uh, surprises or great findings or anything they'd want to report? Any bragging to be done? Well, that's uh, either you guys are very uh, uh, self-confident, don't need to brag, or or we need to keep thinking about you know those provider interviews and and uh, and get some good stories of provider interest in your community. But Nancy, let's go to the breakout rooms then.